So are y'all getting anything out of this? You know, these are just simple truths that we think we should know. But most people honestly don't think like this. When they get into a crisis situation, they don't go back and remind themselves. One of the things that I've done is when crisis hits, you know, I actually turn over to these passages of scriptures and I just go through and remember this. I am not going to panic. I have authority. I will not let my heart be troubled. I'm going to believe in God. Put it into perspective. How's this going to affect eternity? And the Word of God is powerful. And do I really realize the what I've got? Am I like those disciples that says, show us Jesus and we'll be satisfied? And I just go through the power of the Holy Spirit. Am I praying in tongues? Am I doing this? Am I self-centered? Am I saying the right things with my words? Am I abiding in Christ? Am I really drawing into Him? Or am I letting my life be occupied with other things? I go through these things like a check checklist. And you know what? I usually don't have to get but through two or three of them before I've solved the problem. This is just really simple. So I, I want to really encourage you. These things are important. So the next thing that he talks about in verse 9, this is John 15, 9. He says, As the Father hath loved me, so have I loved you. Continue you in my love. If you keep my commandments, you shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments. And abide in His love. These things have I spoken unto you that my joy right, re might remain in you and that your joy might be full. This is my commandment, that ye love one another as I have loved you. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do whatsoever I have commanded you. Henceforth I call you not servants. Now, I believe that in this 15th verse, he's still talking about love. But he's just, he's saying, you know what? I love you so much that in the old covenant, people were the servants of the Lord. And the word servant means slave. And Paul still referred to himself as a bond slave, but it was a voluntary uh, slavery. It wasn't something that God demanded. And Jesus is basically saying, you know what? I'm changing the relationship. You aren't just a slave, a servant anymore. I'm not calling you a servant or a slave, for the servant knoweth not what his Lord doeth. But I have called you friends. For all things that I have heard of my Father, I have made known unto you. And that's a powerful statement. You know, there was only one person in the Old Testament called a friend of God, and that was Abraham. Abraham was called the friend of God. And it's referred to in the Old Testament and then it's quoted in the New Testament. But that's the only person up to this time that was ever called a friend of God. That was just a radical statement. As a matter of fact, Jesus got criticized for his familiarity with the Father and referring to the Father as being Father. People didn't call God Father in the Old Covenant. You know, we've taken some of these things and we've made them religious cliches and we don't think about it. But God wasn't known as a father. He wasn't known as a friend. It was Almighty Jehovah. They wouldn't even say the name Jehovah or Yahweh. They actually abbreviated it. They wouldn't write the name because it was sacrilege to write out the name completely. And so they transliterated and would never even pronounce the name of God. It was so holy. He was so holy and we were so unholy. That's the relationship under the Old Covenant. In the New Covenant, we are now the friends of God. We call Him our Father. And you know what? Sometimes we just have taken this stuff for granted and don't think about it. But this is talking about the love of God for us. Jesus here is describing that I am moving you to a brand new level. I'm putting you on the same level with me. I call God my Father. And you are my friends. I, he goes on to say, I'm making you a brother. All of these things here are, are relating to love. It's talking about the intimacy and the love and the compassion of God for us. And so when you come into a crisis situation, I can guarantee you one of the things that you need to do is go back and revisit how much God loves you. Because when you're in a crisis situation, you know what? Your circumstances are screaming that God doesn't love you. Man, if God loved you, why would God have let this happen? Why, you know, God is going to forsake you. And if you're traumatized, if you're operating in fear, it's actually all because you don't understand love. Perfect love casts out fear. If you're in a crisis situation and it looks like you aren't going to make it and you're fighting fear, you can sit there and rebuke fear or you can try and build your faith or you know what you can do? You can just go back and start reminding yourself of how much God loves you. And the Bible says perfect love casts out fear. 1 John chapter 4, verse 18. 
Galatians 5, 6, faith works by love. You start reminding yourself of the love of God and thinking about how much God loves you. And you know what? Faith is just instantly quickened. Fear instantly goes. Perfect love casts out fear. Fear and faith are, let me say it this way, fear and love are opposites. And if you are really basking in the love of God, there will be no fear. You know, if a little kid was in his father's arms and he was just fearful, oh, Dad, you aren't going to let me drop, are you? You aren't going to let me fall. Are you going to feed me? Will you provide for me? Will you feed me? Can I get clothes? Will you get me a bike when I get old enough? And if they were fearful about whether all these things and they're worried about it, you know what? That kid does not have a real good relationship with their father. If they truly loved and trusted their father, there would just be a blasé attitude about, you know what? My father has always taken care of me. There's no reason for me to do this. And if you saw a kid going around, I confess with my mouth that you're going to feed me today. I confess it and I believe it with my, I confess it with my mouth and believe it in my heart. My dad's not going to drop me. I confess and believe in my heart that he's going to get me a car when I get old enough and that he's going to do this. And you know what? If you saw a kid doing that, you'd think something is wrong in this relationship. That's not the way it works. You don't take responsibility. It's your father's responsibility to provide. If you're worried about, oh God, how's this going to happen? God, I'm taking a step, but, uh, you know, you staying up all night long, you can't sleep because is it going to work? Well, you could sit there and start taking some of the things I've talked about tonight, confession, and start saying, I confess with my mouth and believe in my heart that God's going to do this. And you could start trying to manipulate and control God. Or you could just go back and start reminding yourself of the goodness of God and the faithfulness of God. And God, look how faithful you've been. Look what you've done for me. Look how faithful you've been. And you know what that does? It just makes your faith go through the roof, your fear go out the window. You need to remind yourself of the love of God. And you know, really, it just comes down to this. I can remember a time in my life, I can't remember exactly the way this is, but I bet you it's 15, 20 years ago, that our ministry was going through some really hard times. And my board told me that we were broke and bankrupt and they were going to close the ministry down. And I mean, I was just, we had collectors coming against us and, People telling me some Christian you are. And I mean, we had some hard times. And um, during that period of time, without realizing, you know, if something just persists over and over and over, it seems like that after a while, it just kind of, you know, if you're if you're saturated and just living in that environment, it somehow or another soaks on the inside of you. And I didn't even realize it. If you would have asked me, do you still believe that God loves you and for you? Yeah, I was saying the right things. I hadn't given up. I was still confessing everything's going to work. But you know what? It had begun to bother me. And I didn't realize it until one night I had a dream. And I've told you before, I'm a lucid dreamer and I have these really vivid dreams. And I remember we were living in Woodland Park and I just thought, you know, God, I never, I, can, I can't ever get caught up. We're so far behind. And I, I had a dream that I quit the ministry and join the Air Force just so that I could pay off my debts. And I just quit and gave up. And I woke up and, you know, my dreams are so real. I was thinking, man, was that real? And then I was laying there in bed and I said, oh, thank God, it's just a dream. And I was laying in bed saying, thank you, Jesus. And Jamie leans over and says, it wasn't so bad that you had to quit and join the Air Force. And man, I mean, fear hit me like, oh no, it wasn't a dream. I really did. And I was talking in my sleep and she heard me say that. And so she just <laughs> kind of rubbed it in. And man, I mean, fear hit me. And so during that period of time, you know what? I was trying to resist this fear and trust God and calm my fears. But the truth was, it was bothering me. And I had another dream. And in this dream, I forget all of the details, but I remember the results of it was, that you know what the Lord just basically said to me, have I ever let you down? And all of a sudden I just saw that, you know what, God, I'm so sorry. I was doubting you. It wasn't, you know, it's not, I was trying to rationalize it. It's because this person's called. It's because I failed you in this area and I was, you know, rationalizing. But it, bottom line, he just like peeled back the layers and let me see that, you know, the problem is you don't trust me. You don't really believe in my goodness. You believe I've called you to do something, I'm going to let you fail. And I mean, I just felt the love of God flow over me. And instantly like that, my worries, my fears were gone. And nothing changed, I would say, for years after that. It might have improved right after that situation. 
But you know what? We still, it took us a long time to come out of that. But I mean, from then on, it's just like I was in a bubble. Nothing bothered me. I never lost any sleep. I never joined the Air Force. I, you know, it just I just was totally changed. All of the pressure was off, and I was walking through the fire without the smell of smoke on me just because of the love of God. And I can tell you that if you are anxious and worried, I, it doesn't matter what your circumstances are. And some people say, well, but you don't know what my situation is. Well, you don't know the love of God. If you knew how much God loved you, then, you know what, it will just, perfect love, cast out fear. You could say worry. Worry is fear. You're, you're fearing that something's not going to work out, and so you're worrying and thinking about all the potential wrong. Perfect love will cast out worry. It'll cast out anxiousness. It'll get rid of your frustration. It'll allow you to sleep good at night. You know what, if you're having any of those problems then you aren't made perfect in love. And I'm not saying that to criticize you or saying, well, you're a bad person. No, it just means that you need a greater revelation of God's love. And so how do you do that? Well, I go back to Scripture and I start looking and see the faithfulness of God. And I see somebody over here that missed it big time. Like you could take a million examples, but Elijah is a man who is so anointed of God, called for a drought, called fire down out of heaven saw a great revival, the greatest revival that had ever happened in history up until that time. And he was doing awesome. Saw that widow's son raised from the dead, multiplied her food for three years. I mean, he just had a string of successes. And then Jezebel comes out and threatens him. And if she really wanted to kill him, she would have sent a sword. I mean, she would have sent a soldier with a sword, not a messenger with a note. She was trying to intimidate him and he got intimidated by this woman and ran, tucked tail and ran and was crying out, Oh God, I'm the only one serving you. And in 1 Kings chapter 18, uh, one of the servants of uh, Ahab told him, I, did, Wasn't it told you that I have hid a hundred of the Lord's prophets and fed them for these three and a half years? It was a lie when he said, I'm the only one serving you. It was a lie and he knew it was a lie. He had information to the contrary. But you know what? Sometimes when you get discouraged, you know that, you know, you sing this song, everybody hates me, nobody loves me, I'm going to eat a worm. Did y'all ever sing that? <laughs> you know that it's wrong. You know that that's not right, but that's the way you feel. And so you're just going to speak forth your feelings. That's what uh, Elijah was doing. You know what? I'm the only one left. He knew that wasn't true, but that's the way he felt. And so here he was griping and complaining. And God said, Elijah, what are you doing here? He says, I'm the only one. God said, no, I've got 7,000 serving me. And so he asked him a second time. You know, if you, if you had the Lord ask you a question, and if you gave an answer, and then he asked you again, it ought to be a clue that you missed it the first time, or he wouldn't have, asked, he wouldn't have given you this test over if you passed it the first time. But Elijah comes up with the exact same answer. God, I'm the only one. And you know what? The Lord says, that's it, Elijah. Go anoint your successor. Go take Elisha and anoint him and anoint Jehu and anoint... Um, um, who was it? Anyway, he told him three things. To go anoint Jehu to take over from Ahab. Go anoint Haziel to take over from Benadab. And go anoint Elisha to replace you. He, he was speaking to him in an audible voice. Told him three things to do. You know what he did? The last one. He was ready to quit. He went and anointed Elisha to take over his place and he never did anoint Jehu and he never did anoint Benadad and Elisha, his replacement, 13 years later, went and anointed them and did that. A, uh, Elisha, Elijah missed two-thirds of what God told him to do in an audible voice. Just totally disobeyed God. Missed it big time. And yet... He walked with God so much that 2 Kings chapter 2, he was translated and didn't die, but was caught up into heaven in a whirlwind. You know what? The guy blew it big time. The guy was a failure in a lot of ways, but he still walked with God. And he, oh, he walked in love, even though he had messed up big time. And he had just literally blown it. And um, he cost people their lives. Because of that, Benadad came and besieged Samaria. And Benadad 
caused so much damage that people were eating their own children, cutting them in two and boiling and eating their own children. You know, if Ben-Adad hadn't have been the king, that wouldn't have happened. Elijah caused that, his disobedience. And then Ahab killed Naboth and took possession of his vineyard. If Jehu had been the king, that never would have happened to Naboth. Elijah was responsible for Naboth's death and all of those things. Elijah caused a lot of problems. And yet, God translated him into heaven and he was caught up into heaven. Man, that's pretty powerful. You know what? Sometimes we think God just gives us what we deserve. You need to recognize that God is a God of mercy and love. And you know what? God can still bless you. Elijah did not fulfill what God told him to do. The ministry of Elisha may not have even ever happened if he would have been faithful. And so God took away, you know, like Colin was saying in that verse, he took it away, but that didn't mean he forsook him and he was still used. And Elijah walked with God. And he was under a covenant that is inferior to us. He wasn't the friend of God. He didn't call God Father. And yet, he was able to have a relationship with God after just totally disobeying God and being caught up. So you know what? When I get into a position to where things are going hard and it looks like, God, I've messed up and how could you ever use me? See, I go back to Scripture. And say, God, this was under an old covenant when you were wrathful and you were imputing people's sins unto them. And look at how Elijah was able to recover from his failure. Man, if you loved him that much, much more now do you love us. That's out of uh, Romans chapter 5, verse 8 and 9. And if they had glory, what we have is so much more glorious. 2 Corinthians chapter 3. And see, I take examples of how uh, Samson... Failed God big time. Fell into sexual sin. Broke his vow. Did all of these things. And he suffered consequences. Got his eyes put out. And he got the grinding mill. And yet, he says, God, strengthen me one more time. And you know what? He drew on his relationship with God. And God strengthened him. And he slew more people in his death than he ever slew in his life. He went out with a shout. He went out glorifying God. And this is a man who missed it in sexual sin. Just terrible. And yet look how God honored that. And there was a way to recover. If God will do that for a person under the old covenant when the people's sins were being imputed unto him, how much more does God love me? See, these are the things I go through. Anytime I go to doubting God's love, I'll just go back to the Word and I'll start seeing examples of God's love and showing how merciful God is. And then I'll go back and I'll remember what God's done in my life and remind myself. You know, I could get plumb off the subject right here and teach on something that would really benefit you, but memory is one of the greatest tools that you have. And the Scripture is aware that it's our tendency to forget. That's the reason it says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all of His benefits. The reason He tells you not to forget is because it's your tendency to forget. You need to make an effort to not forget. Because when you go back and start remembering the faithfulness of God, I guarantee you, it just refreshes you. It builds you up. And I've actually had people come up to me before. I, I remember one person in particular that they were believing God for something like $100. They needed something and it ha they had prayed and it hadn't come through. And this person came up and, you know what? If God doesn't give me this $100, I'm quitting. I'm walking away from it. This doesn't work. And they came to me with that attitude. And I knew them. And I said... You were saved out of a life of where you were killing yourself. You were a drug addict. You were a mess. And God has done a miracle. God healed your marriage. God healed your body. This person was incurably, uh, had some incurable disease and they were miraculous. And I started going back and just rehearsing the faithfulness of God. And I said, how dare you have that attitude because you didn't get $100 meant. And you know, after I got through rebuking them, this person was just crying, I'm so sorry, I forgot, what was I thinking? It's amazing how people forget the goodness of God. You need to go back and rehearse this. And so when I come into a crisis situation and your situation you're in right now looks bad and you're having thoughts come to you that are negative, you know one of the things I do to dilute that situation and to take the power away from it, I'll just sit down and go back and start rehearsing how good God's been to me. 
Man, I'll go back and think about, I got born again when I was eight years old. First time God ever nailed me over sin. Not the first time I ever sinned, but the first time I really was convicted. And man, that was the goodness of God that gave me that opportunity. And I sought God my whole life. And I got this experience, March the uh, 23rd, 1968. God's touched me in the way that he hadn't touched everybody. Man, and I go back and think about God, you're so good. You're awesome. God protected me, took me through Vietnam. I should have been killed dozens of times. And you know what? God's been faithful to me. I go back and remember how, you know, I can look at my marriage. It was supernatural the way God put us together. I can look at our kids that they should have died. They, one of them did die and God raised him from the dead. And I just go back and start rehearsing my victories. And you know what? By the time you get up to where you are and whatever problem you're facing, it's really paling in comparison to all of these wonderful things that God has done. And it just shrinks your problem down to where it's like, God, I'm sorry that I even was asking you about this. You know what? It's not really a big deal. I've been brought through a lot worse things than this. And nine out of ten times, by the time you get up to your current crisis, it's not a big deal. It's just because you were so focused on it, you magnified it and amplified it and blew it out of proportion. When you go back and remember the good things that God has done, it just shrinks your problems down to where it's nothing. And you know, people that don't remember and that don't rehearse their victories, it's like you wake up every morning like a goose in a new world. Every day is just total... Individual units, you have no history, you don't know what's going on, and so you forget that God has delivered you from dope and, al dope and alcoholism and all of these wonderful things, and you just, can God deliver me now? It's like the children of Israel came out of the land of Egypt, and they were delivered from the mightiest nation on the face of the earth, and it's just like, that never happened. Man, God brought us out here to kill us. Can God provide a table in the wilderness? Can God bring water out of a rock? Certainly he could. The things that he had already done were greater manifestations than those. You wonder how can people get there? You don't have to look very far because you know what? Most of us have done it. Most of us have had God be really good to us and we just forget it. So I believe that this is what Jesus is saying when he says, you know, I'm giving you a new commandment. Man, abide in my love. If you will abide in my love. He's talking to them the night before crucifixion. If they would have gone back, just put yourself in the disciples' place. They had had Jesus be merciful, show kindness. The religious system was excluding the prostitutes and the Pharisees and the tax collectors and those people were ungodly. Jesus had shown love and mercy towards those people. Jesus had been moved with compassion and saw blind eyes open and Miracles happened. They had seen love manifest in the flesh. They had seen a person operate in love, turn the other cheek, be kind to people. They had seen a person exhibit love like nobody else ever had. And you know what? If they would have abode in that, if they would have just been thinking about God, you are so awesome. Look at what you've done. You know what? That love of Christ would have constrained them and compelled them. They would have understood that love can't be killed by hate. They could have overcome those things. They could have survived. Perfect love would have cast out fear. Even if they didn't understand the revelation of the, of the uh, resurrection. If they didn't have full revelation of that. If they would have just been thinking about, man, look how much love. Look how Jesus has been so good to us. Nobody's ever treated me this way. You know what? If, I, if they kill me and if I die right alongside Jesus, they could have had the attitude that Peter had in the fourth chapter where they were beaten and they left rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name's sake. They could have been so full of the love of God that they would have said, Father, it'll be an honor if they kill us and we get to die like Jesus did. Somebody thought, oh, you can't do that. Yes, you can. Peter did it. James did it. You know what? The love of Christ will constrain you. There is no fear in love. You can get to where you love God so much that you don't care. Nothing. It's worth anything. It's worth your life. It's worth everything you've got. Nothing compares with God. I'm telling you, I know some of you think that, you know what, I'm just talking in theoretical terms and that this isn't practical, but don't wake me up. This is where I'm living. I went through Vietnam in a bubble because I had just had this experience with God and I loved God so much that I had people shooting at me, trying to kill me, and it didn't even faze me. It wasn't a problem. I was ready. 
I was ready to die. Matter of fact, I spent nearly 13 months while I was in Vietnam asking God to kill me because I just was so ready to go. I thought this would be great. Did I ever tell you the story about the guy that gave me the book about Vietnam? One of you is saying yes, the others are saying no. <laughs> did you hear this on a tape or did I say it in this class? Let me just give this to you real quickly. But I, you know, 20 years after I got back from Vietnam, I was ministering in Chicago and a guy gave me a book and said, read this book. And it had 12 testimonies of people who had been through Vietnam and were traumatized and had all of these disorders and stuff. And then they got born again and it gave their testimony. And it was a Pulitzer Prize winner and it was really a well-written book. And his testimony was in there. So he gave this to me and asked me to read it. So I, I read his testimony because I knew he had asked me about it the next day. And it was so good that I wound up reading another and another. And I wound up reading the entire book. Stayed up most of the night reading that book. And it was powerful. And one of the things that got me, three of the people were there the exact same time that I was in Vietnam. Two of those were in the AmeriCal division that I was in. And they were talking about cities that I had been in. And I can't prove this because they didn't give all of the details, but I think I was there on LZ West out on the Laotian border. It was a temporary fire support base on a mountain. It was just like that. And I mean that you couldn't walk up it or anything. And it was a fire support base where they put artillery to support the troops that were out in the field. And they would call in and we'd shoot and stuff like that. And I was a chaplain's assistant, and we went out there because that thing was just about to be overrun, and he knew that a lot of those guys were going to be killed. And so the chaplain went out there. We flew in, and we held a meeting the day before LZ West was overrun by the Viet Cong. And while I was there, it was an area about twice the size of this room. And within our perimeter, we had little Quonset hut type of things, like a culvert. And they were reinforced, and so we were in there. And inside of that perimeter, in about four hours, we took something like 150, 170 direct mortar hits. I mean, we were being pounded. And you could see the machine gun fire and the rifle fire from the Vietnamese as they come up. And they were close enough, you could smell the Vietnamese. You could smell a Vietnamese a mile off. Because they ate this fish, and I mean, it you, you could smell them coming a long ways off. And so... Anyway, I was in this situation, and when we got uh, helicoptered out because of the chaplain, you know, they extracted him, but uh, they left the rest of the troops there, and that hill got overrun within two hours of us leaving, and they were shooting at our helicopter as we took off. And anyway, I remember all of this, and I remember seeing the muzzle fire from these weapons coming up this hill, and I had my M16 pointed down the hill, and if they, they were too far away for me to shoot at them, so I didn't shoot. But I'm saying, if they would have got close enough, I would have shot. I would have defended myself. But you know what? Instead of fear, I was think I was just excited. I was thinking, God, this is awesome. Man, today could be my day. I could be with you before the sun is down. I was so excited. I was just thrilled. And th what I was doing... I was praying for those Vietnamese, thinking, God, these people don't know you. And I felt love and compassion flowing out of me. And it was actually a positive experience. It was, it was a good time. I know some of you think, you're weird. But that's exactly what I thought. As a matter of fact, I never wrote about this to anybody. I never mentioned it to anybody because it's just another day in Vietnam. I went, I went through a lot of days like that. I never even thought about it until I was reading this book 20 years later. And all of a sudden, I read from an unbeliever. This guy who wrote was not saved. And he described the smell and the fear and how that they knew that they were going to be overrun. And there was like 20 or 30 guys on this hill. And there was 5,000 NVA troops that were coming up these mountain. And, you know, uh, he was describing what it was like. And 20 years after I was there, I saw it what it would have been like without Christ and fear came over me and it took me two or three days praying in tongues and rebuking things to overcome the fear that I should have felt when I was there. And you know what? It was just a testimony to me about how that because I was walking in the love of God, perfect love cast out fear. I had no fear. It was, it was just, it was a significant time in my life because it's like the Lord pulled back a veil and let me see what it would have been like had I not have been walking with the Lord. 
And yet, Vietnam for me was a super positive experience because I was just in love with God. I was seeking God. And you know what? It was one of the greatest times in my life. Not because Vietnam was good, but because God was good. And I'm telling you that you can live a life enveloped in God's love like that so that it doesn't matter if people are mad. You people come and say, but look what they've done. Look what this person said. It doesn't matter. God's love is greater than whatever your problem is. Some people say, well, I, I believe, yeah, that's true to a degree, but if you're going through a divorce, something's wrong with you if you don't fall apart like a $2 suitcase. It's not true. You know what? If you are in, walking in the love of God, I'm not saying that you can like it. I'm not saying that you should like it. You ought to pray against that kind of thing because God hates divorce. God wants to see the marriage work. But you know, if worse comes to worse, God's not going to divorce you. You could still rejoice. There's life after divorce. It's not the end of the world. God loves you. And if God loves you, if God's for you, who can be against you? You could be like Elijah that just flat out rebelled at two-thirds of the things God told him to do and missed it and caused people to die and terrible things. And yet he knew that God loved him and he continued to walk with God and God translated him. If that'll work for Elijah, it'll work for you. You don't have a problem that the love of God can't solve. The love of God will cause faith to work. Faith works by love. The love of God will cast out fear. It will cause you to have peace and joy. And so, you know what? I just, any time I begin to start crumbling and I get worried, I get fearful, I get anxious, it's, a, it's an indication to me that, you know what? I'm not thinking about the goodness of God. I'm not thinking about how much God loves me. I've let something obscure that and take my attention off of it. And so I go back. You know, when I was a kid, we played this game. We called it wolf and sheep. You, you know, it's variations of it. People call it different things. But anyway, you have a home base where as long as you're on this home base, you're free, you're safe. And then this wolf had a, uh, is usually our back porch it would catch people and put them there. And you had to stay there unless somebody came and touched you and set you free. And then this wolf, if he touched you, he took you to his den. But this, we had this tree that was a home base and it was safe. And anyway, you'd try and venture out and go set the other people free, you know. And it was just a game that we played. But uh, any time that you were out there and, boy, this wolf came after you, you know what you did? You headed for home base. Boy, that was just like your safe place. That was your sweet spot. And boy, you just didn't get too far away from that. You never let that wolf get in between you and that home base. You always kept your play, your avenue to that home base clear because if worse came to worse, man, you'd run back and get in that safe place. And that's the way I feel about the love of God. It was the love of God that changed my life. And I know how much God loves me. And you know what? I don't ever... Let anything come in between me and the love of God. And if I do have a problem, man, I just immediately shut everything down and go back to thinking about God, you love me. And if worse comes to worse, if I die, I'm going to win because he loves me and I got a mansion prepared in heaven. And I go back and think about God, how faithful you've been and look what you've done. And as I go to rehearse in God's faithfulness and thinking about his love, you know what? All of my problems just melt away. I get into a, that bubble again to where I could have people trying to kill me and it doesn't matter. It's not a problem. Amen? I know some of you think I'm weird, but I think you're weird if you don't live this way. This is normal Christianity. is just dwelling. Keep yourself in the love of God is what Jude chapter 1 verse 21 says. It's up to you to keep yourself in the love of God. If you don't feel the love of God, say, oh God, do you still love me? Yeah. Well, that's unbelief. You need to take what the Word says, that yes, He does love you. And Father, I'm sorry, I'm just not walking in it. And so, open up the eyes of my understanding and help me to see this. And you just go back and start reminding yourself and appropriate. And go to the Word of God and see it. Yes, ma'am. Did you have a comment? Say I have a daughter that's like that. She's in Indonesia now. And uh, she, she believes for Jesus' love so strongly in she wrote me last week and she said, I'm flying around in these crummy airplanes from island to island. She said, but you don't hear from me by next week. I'm safe with Jesus in heaven. Amen. You know, we had a student, Fred, that his son died yesterday, I think it was, overdosed on drugs. And uh, he tried to call me in the middle of the night, but never found my phone number. And anyway, he left and went back to, where was it, Phoenix or someplace? 
students took up an offering for him and helped him get back there because he didn't have the money. And anyway, it's a very similar situation to my son that died. My son overdosed on drugs. His son overdosed on drugs. And you know what? He was just, I'm not saying this to fault him, but he was commanding and demanding that God do something. He was wanting me to agree. Did you know that? That's not the way that I saw my son raised from the dead. We did speak our faith and we did take authority and command him to come back into his body. But I'm aware that, you know what, you can't control another person to 100%. And so as we were going in, I was aware and that, you know, there was no guarantee that Peter was coming back because Peter did this to himself. God didn't do it. He's reaping what he sows. It's a law of God. And the way that I approached it, instead of saying, I demand this and I'm commanding and instead of me standing there, you know what I did? I started going back because I was feeling like, God, this isn't right. You failed me. And I, I knew that was wrong, but that's how I felt. And so what I started doing was just going back exactly what we're doing and saying, Father, you're a good God. You did not cause this. I started reminding myself of the love of God and say, God, you've been good to me. You've been faithful. And I just started praising Him. And I started getting back on that home base and refusing to move off of love. And I told him, I said, I don't care if my son ever comes back to life. You are not my problem. I am going to love you. And I started refreshing myself in the love of God. And faith works by love. As soon as I started reminding myself of the love of God, faith started rising. And then all of a sudden I remembered promises and prophecies that God had given me. And you know what? I mean, a gift of faith rose up on the inside of me. But it wasn't, I wasn't pursuing faith. And I wasn't looking for a result. You know what I was doing? I was ministering the love of God to myself. And I was just praising God and refusing to come out of believing that God loved me. And it was the love of God actually that was the key that made everything else work. So I didn't sit there and bombard the gates of heaven and demand this and storm and say, I'm confessing this. You know what I did? I, I admitted that my son might not come back to life. Some of you might think that that's... Not a statement of faith, but I can't control another person, even if it's my son. Once they're, you know, I think he was 24, 25 years old at the time. You know, he was on his own. He was making his decisions. I couldn't guarantee he was going to come back to life, but I could guarantee that God wasn't the source of my problem and that God's a good God. And I just started praising him and drawing close and reminding myself of the goodness of God. And boy, my faith was quickened and he was raised from the dead after being dead for five hours. Praise God. It works. I'm telling you that, that love is the key. You could say it this way, relationship with God is the key, but it has to be this intimate relationship where you don't know Him as a, as a master, although He is our master, and it's not totally wrong to say that, but you have to know the intimacy, the love of God. It's the love of God that casts out fear. It's the love of God that makes faith work. So when you're in a crisis situation, I was in a crisis situation. You know what I did? I ministered the love of God to myself. I refused to get out of that. I refused to let circumstances tell me that God didn't care, that God didn't care about me. And I started saying, God, this isn't your fault. You did not cause this. And I started reminding myself and building myself up in the love of God. I started keeping myself in the love of God, which is what... Jude chapter 1 verse 21 says. So in a crisis situation, I believe that this is why Jesus is bringing this up and telling the guys, man, abide in me. He told them that's in the first part of the 15th chapter. And then he says, if you abide in my love, you are abiding in me. Go back and remind yourself of the goodness of God. Remember that God commended his love towards you and that while you were yet a sinner, Christ died for you. You hadn't done everything perfectly then. Some of you were whoremongers. Liars, thieves, dope addicts, adulterers. And God loved you so much that He died for you. How much more now, even though you didn't read your Bible as much as you should have, even though you lost your temper and got into strife, even though you didn't do everything perfect, how much more does God love you now than He did when He first died for you? Man, if you would just follow that line of thinking and refuse to sit there and accept condemnation. You know, it would bring you out of the funk that you're in and it'd get you into faith. I think I told you this example where Joshua, when he was only nine months or ten months old, got sick and for three days he didn't move and he was running a super high fever and he didn't move, he didn't make a sound, he didn't eat. Nine months old for three days and he was running a super high fever. We didn't take a 
thermometer to check how bad it was. We didn't go to a doctor. I was believing God with everything I was. And it's a long story, but I had stood up and argued with a lady over a lady that I considered to be a spiritual mentor and my wife and my mother and my sister told me I was in the flesh, I was wrong, how dare I do this and I still don't think I was, but nonetheless, whether I was or wasn't, I got condemned. And when I saw Joshua get sick, I was speaking and commanding healing and believing God for it, but you know what in my heart I was thinking, well, this is what I get. I'm in sin. I deserve this. And it looked like Joshua was going to die. I don't know how bad it was, but it looked bad. And you know what? I had my associate pastor, Marshall Townsley, come over and sit on my stereo. And he started rebuking me. And he says, you're a hypocrite. You preach that God loves us regardless of whether we deserve it or not. And you preach grace to everybody else. And yet you're sitting there letting your son stay sick because you don't feel worthy. You feel like you failed him. He said, you're a hypocrite. And he read me the riot act, rebuked me. And when they left, Cindy, his wife, got on his case. He only lived three minutes away and he didn't even make it all the way home before he got so convicted. He turned around to come and apologize for condemning me. But you know what? Within five minutes, before he could get back to my house, Joshua was totally healed because it was true. I had let Satan make me think, you know what? You deserve this. And another way of saying that is I let him made me doubt that God really loved me because I wasn't worth loving. And as soon as I saw that, man, I repented. And I went in there and faith works by love. As soon as I said, Father, I know this isn't you. You would never do this to me or to my son because of something I've done. And as soon as I got myself straightened out, then I spoke in faith and boom, he was healed by the time Marshall could get back to my house. I'm telling you, regardless what you think the problem is, if you got a problem, you got a problem understanding how much God loves you. If you understand God loves you, it'll make everything else work. That's just the way it is. That's good preaching. So when you're in a crisis situation, this ought to be one of the things you do. You need to run back to that safe place. You need to say, God, somewhere I'm not really focused on how much you love me or my faith would be working better. I wouldn't have fear. Perfect love, cast out fear. And you just go back and start ministering the love of God to yourself. You know, when I first understood that God loved me independent of my performance, I knew it intellectually, but my heart couldn't receive it because I had spent an entire lifetime thinking that, you know, I was unworthy and that God wouldn't love me. And so what I used to do, I haven't done this in a long time, but I used to do it a lot. I would stand in a mirror, in front of a mirror, and I would point my finger at myself and look myself eyeball to eyeball and say, Andrew, God loves you. He loves you just like you've never sinned. And I'd preach to myself. And some of you think, well, that's weird. It worked. I tell you what, it impacted me. First few times I did that, all the hair on the back of my neck stood up like, oh God, don't kill me for saying this. <laughs> but you know what? After a while, I started believing it. And I preached to myself. You have to encourage yourself in the Lord your God. What it says in First John chapter, I mean, First uh, Samuel chapter 30, verse 5 and 6. David encouraged himself in the Lord your God. We just say, oh God, I'm discouraged. Please send somebody. Man, you got the Holy Ghost on the inside of you. You know what the Word says. If you aren't feeling the love of God, minister it to yourself. Keep yourself in the love of God, praying in the Holy Ghost. Preach to yourself. Go back to Scripture. Study it and remind yourself. Tell your flesh to get in line. Say, I don't care how you feel. This is the truth. Amen. And keep yourself in the love of God. If you'll do that, I guarantee you, everything will work out good for you. Isn't that simple? That's good preaching. I got blessed. Amen. Anybody else got a question, comment? Yes, ma'am. Well, I just want to share this with everyone. Uh, on 3-11 the other night, I had this lucid dream with the Heavenly Father. And my Father is in heaven. And me and all called up. And I started to open my mouth and the Lord said, And so he sent me back down. And he said, read Luke 4. Specifically look at 23 through 25. So then when I was reading that, he said, no, no reason. 1 Kings 17. And then you were speaking everything about Elijah and everything. And what he's basically was saying to me was, I'm like the widow, and my son is coming to Christ now because he kind of was struggling a little. And this is my son Matthew. And 
it's like he spoke through you, Holy Spirit, and you just said everything, and you reconfirmed it for me, what the Lord was telling me, because I took notes and everything yesterday and last night. And you know, if you go to talking about how much God loves you, the reaction you're going to get from people is like, who do you think you are? Why do you think God would love you that way? Well, it's humbling. If you don't say that, you don't, you're not in true humility and giving God all the gratitude that He deserves. But see, people will criticize you because people look on the outward appearance. God looks on the heart. God sees you forgiven, cleansed of all sin, a brand new creature. You tend to evaluate yourself and other people based on your actions. And when you talk about that God loves you and you know that God carries your picture in His wallet, when you say something like that, people get offended like, so you think you're special. No, I think God's special. I think God is awesome to love somebody like me. Amen. Well, amen. On the day on the judgment seat, when you get to go up to heaven, I'm not going to tell Jesus you did a crummy job of creating me, Father. I'm going to say thank you. I love the way you made me. Well, I'm not sure I'd take it exactly. I would say my born again self. I love who I am in Christ. But you know what? I have totally messed up God's creation of me. I'm not the person that God intended me to be. But this physical flesh isn't the part of me that God loves. And it's not the part of me that's saved. Yeah, my born again spirit. I'm thrilled with my born again spirit. But you know, I had an experience where... What time is this over? 9.30. I got a couple of minutes. I had an experience when I first started understanding the love of God. And um, I stayed over at these people's house on Sunday because it was 45 miles to church and about an hour and a half drive through Dallas and stuff. And so uh, I'd go over on Sunday morning and stay Sunday afternoon so that I could go to church on Sunday night. And I stayed in these people's home. And their daughter hated God and hated all Christians and hated me more than all other Christians. She was like 20-something years old, and she was very rebellious, and she just hated me. So anytime I was over at their house, she would leave to avoid me. And I'd confronted her a few times, but it never was a positive experience. So anyway, one day I was over there, and I was really sleepy, and people said, just go up you know, to our daughter's room and take a nap. And I said, well, she mind? And says, no, she's, she won't be here as long as you're here. So... I went up to her room, and I was laying on her bed taking a nap. And anyway, I was totally asleep, and all of a sudden... The door opened, and I mean, just like that, I was just totally awake. But my first thought was, "Uh uh-oh, it's, you know, you could tell somebody just barely opened the door and stuff, and I thought somebody's sneaking around, and so I said, it's probably this girl that had something in her room that she wanted to come get. She doesn't want to see me. I didn't want to see her, so I just played possum, and I laid there on the bed just listening And they walked in, and you could hear the floor creak, and they walked over, and there was a drawer that was opened and stuff. And I was just sitting there listening to all of this. And then they walked up and stood right here beside the bed, and I could, you know, hear them breathing. And they were standing beside the bed, and I was wondering, "Uh uh-oh, what's going on? (laughs) And then they sat down on the bed, and when that happened, I, you know, I could feel the bed move. And I thought, I'm afraid to open my eyes now. (laughs) And so I was just laying there playing possum. And then they leaned across me. You could feel their weight shift. And they put their arm across me and leaned over and kissed me right on the mouth. And when that happened, boom, I was awake. And I sat right up. And you know what? There wasn't a person in that room. And when that happened, I thought, God, is that you? And then my next thought was, God, if he walked into this room, wouldn't kiss me. He'd slap me upside the head. He'd tell me how sorry I am. And then my next thought was, well, if he died for me, you know, I'd, he'd, he'd, he'd do something like that. But, you know, it was probably 15 or 20 years before I told anybody about that because what would people think? People would sit, people would sit there and think, who do you think you are? I wasn't saying any of those things because I deserved it. It's just the goodness 